this is a lecture series that is meant to be in the kind of way. And we try and seize the opportunity when we can to showcase the work of some of our graduate students. So um, this is actually yet another uh, wonderful, brilliant graduate student whose work merits to be shared with other uh, colleagues. Um, uh, today's lecture is uh, a very timely uh, lecture at this moment uh, in history, and some of you are attending the course on the novel and history, so um, it, it's quite relevant to both the times, but also what we're doing in class, in another class. Um, our speaker today is Margaret Pierre Gilligan, and she is a graduate student in the Department of Arab and Islamic Civilizations. Um, the work she's been present is going to present today uh, is based on a couple of papers, actually, that she's already written, one in class with me and one in class with Dr. Hadou, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so just to let you know that these people come to where they're at today at the podium, after having worked um, their way up to the podium through their class workshops and class uh, projects. Um, Maggie's le uh, lecture today is entitled Ahmad de Bourgogne, a very intriguing title actually. Ahmad de Bourgogne, uh, Between Translation and Migration. So without further ado, please help me welcome. So, over the past few weeks, there has been an uproar over the closing of a refugee camp called the Jungle from the Hach to Zingel in Calais, France. Calais is situated on the border of France and the UK, and many of the immigrants and refugees who currently call the camp home are those who have been stopped on the border while trying to reach the UK. Authorities are currently planning on attempting to reduce the camp from 9,000 to 2,000 people. Additionally, there are plans to build a literal wall on the border between France and the UK to prevent migrants and refugees from crossing it. I wonder where they got that idea from. These attitudes that spur attempts to quite literally get rid of migrants stare at the very root of both the cause of the migrant crisis in the first place, and then the struggles migrants, refugees, and their children face in most countries of the global north. Today, I would like to focus on the role translation plays in both exposing these prejudices and shaping the migrant experience. Migration is the act of translating the self. I don't say this to try and romanticize what it means to migrate or to overcomplicate what can be a decision that boils down simply to choosing the course of one's greatest chance for survival, but rather in an attempt to add to the discussion of not only why migration happens, but why people are impacted by the odyssey that is migration in the ways that they are. We are in a historical moment that is defined by migration and specifically forced migration due to colonization, war, and capitalism that all stem, in one way or another, from ethno-nationalism and racism. At least for the purposes of this lecture, this is the analytical trajectory of these issues that I would like to take. Returning the focus to migration, for the purposes of this lecture, I'd like to conceptualize it as a translation of the self, and use translation as a framework which allows for the intersection between translation and journey that creates encounters which mandate translation to be analyzed. The work which I am discussing today, Ahmed de Bourgogne, by Azus Nagak and Ahmed Benedit, in particular is representative of such an encounter between translation and migration. Ahmed de Bourgogne is the story of a French national's wrongful deportation and subsequent ordeal that he must undergo in order to return to France. It can be read as a very early translation of the clandestine ordeal in Europe and elsewhere, and is one concrete instance of a global problem. Situations like Calais illustrate the importance and timeliness of undertaking such a translation into English. Additionally, it is a text that, when read in a literary way, resists and transforms hegemonic Western literary conventions in multiple ways. First of all, while presented in the physical form of a novel, which is to say, printed, bound, and with too many pages to be considered a short story, how it came to be has very little in common with the typical roman français which is not to say that it should not be considered a novel, but this is a topic for another discussion. Active de Bourbon is a story that would not exist without both migration and translation. 
as migration and journey are both forms of physical, cultural, and linguistic translation in and of themselves. Ahmed de Bourbon is based on the odyssey the man Ahmed ben Adif underwent when trying to return to France clandestinely after having been deported for a crime he did not commit. In France, this is referred to as a double peine, and people who do not possess French citizenship but are convicted of crimes can be subjected to both serving their sentence in France and then being deported from the country afterwards. Ahmed, our hero of sorts, was eligible for the double peine because, even though he had been born and raised in France, his father retained Algerian citizenship for his children, as he was hoping to return one day to the country of his birth. Ahmed's Algerian roots position him in France as a Beur, which is the word used to describe French people of North African or Arab origin. Beur is a play on the French word for Arab, Abat, using what the French call back slang or Verdun, and the term Beur is generally uh, used generally to mean someone who is European born, but whose parents or grandparents are of North African origin. Many Beurs continue to be systematically disenfranchised in France and denied attempts at assimilation, both through socioeconomic disenfranchisement and discrimination due to French ethno religious nationalism. Even after multiple generations, many Beurs still mainly live in shanty towns on the outside of French metropolis, mainly because of the cumulative impact of xenophobia and racism on socioeconomic mobility and on the search for housing. It is one such shanty town where Ahmed's story begins. Ahmed is honest with his reader in telling them about how he struggled in school and is quite open about his flaws. He has a troubled relationship with his father and as such leaves home as soon as possible once he turns 18. His girlfriend at the time becomes frightened and while he says he loves her and their daughter and works hard to help maintain them, he has multiple affairs while he is supposed to be with his family. It is one such affair which goes awry and that gets him into trouble. When an upper class French woman who Ahmed is seeing realizes he is also seeing her seeing her daughter, unbeknownst to him as Ahmed claims, at the same time, she accuses Ahmed of rape. He is found guilty and thrown in jail. While in jail, his wife dies and his daughter goes to live with her grandparents. After his sentence is up, as he says, he knows it is only a matter of time before he is deported. One day, after being confused with another man suspected of assaulting two people on the same day, he is again put in jail for a crime he did not commit. After his sentence is up, he is deported to Algeria, the land where he is told he comes from, despite him never having even visited, let alone lived there. Ahmed is sent through multiple different border patrols, experiencing either physical violence or verbal abuse at each one. From here, he traverses 10 countries clandestinely, enduring further abuse from border authorities and those who make a living specializing in clandestine crossings, all in order to return to the country considers to be his home. When he finally returns at one in the morning to his family's home in Lyon, Ahmed rings the doorbell and knocks on the door only to realize that there is no one waiting for him. As he finds a sheltered corner in which to pass the night, he reflects on his journey and realizes that he had only just sur surmounted his first hurdle. Now he has to start over from nothing, with no identification, no family, and in a country that has made its feeling towards him quite clear. Ahmed de Bourbon was conceived after the author, Azuz Begat, made the acquaintance of Ahmed ben Adif at a parish in Lyon, where Ahmed ended up finding a place to stay upon his return to France. The two men are both French nationals of Algerian origin and part of the Berg generations. However, whereas Azuz assimilated to a certain degree into the French mainstream and went on to become a renowned writer, academic, and politician, Ahmed, despite his best efforts and intentions, as his story shows, is illiterate and, at the time when he and Azuz meet, technically holds an illegal status in France, having been chewed up by French politics that were never meant to allow Arab immigrants and their descendants to succeed in the first place, which at the same time makes Azusa's accomplishments all the more important. As they become friendlier and Ahmed started to share his story with Azuz, Azuz eventually, because he felt bad for Ahmed, as he says, offered to write a book if Ahmed would record the story on the tape recorder. The presence of translation throughout this novel is multifold. First, Ahmed translates his physical journey into a verbal one. Azuz then takes that journey and translates it into a written or literary journey. I then come in and then translate this journey from French to English. As such, in the particular case of this work, what it means to translate translations must be discussed as well. A creative process such as this calls into question the paternity, so to speak, of the work. Are Azuz and Ahmed co-authors, or are they both translators and adapters of sorts? How much of the difference is there really between authors, translators, and adapters? These questions are further complicated by the power dynamics that exist between Azuz and Ahmed. 
While this story may belong to Ahmed, it would not be possible to disseminate it without the Sufi's education, connections, and social safety, something which is of note when discussing the dissemination of minority literatures in general. Even if these stories are written down and published, how well will they really be promoted, and who will then decide to read them? As such, if one chooses to use this as a translator, his access to the resources necessary to disseminate Ahmed's story gives him much more power than in the typical author-translator relationship described in translation studies, where the translator is viewed as of secondary importance to the author, who has the favor of publishing systems. Arguably, this is already the dynamic of an author-translator relationship, where a story is viewed as belonging to an author, which is made possible through commodifying it in the tangible form of a book, and could not presumably be disseminated to another audience without the translator's language and translation skills. However, in practice, the role of the translator is viewed as secondary, and such skill sets are undervalued, necessitating Venuti's comment in his essay, How to Read a Translation, that, quote, the translator is no stand-in or ventriloquist for the foreign author, but a resourceful imitator who rewrites the original to appeal to another audience in a different language and culture. But if, additionally, I would argue that it is problematic to say that stories can belong to anyone, and to conceive of authors as those who own them, and such a problematic does come up later between Ahmed and the Zeus. Indeed, in her article, Ahmed de Vergon, The Impossible Autobiography of a Clandestine, Sandia Mahrez refers to the two men as co-authors. She puts the term in quotation marks, which implies that this is not the true nature of their relationship. She further elaborates on the nature of the personal and professional relationship of the Zeus and Ahmed by explaining, on the one hand, Gav describes their collaborative effort as a symbolic process of transfusion, whereby the writer becomes the devotee. On the other hand, according to Gav's account, the two men had well-defined roles in the project from the outset. In his initial proposition to Benedict, Gav makes the deal clear. If you can record your story, I will write a book. Gav, at least, is fully aware that the book he will write is bound to be different from the oral story. Having to account for this imbalance, double author and translatorship when translating Ahmed de Burgoni into English adds yet another layer to the translation process, which will be discussed later on. The Nuti's quote also opens up other questions when translating this text, particularly with his assumption that the author is foreign. But Zeus is not actually translating a text originating in a different national country to a foreign language, but his presence is necessitated nevertheless to translate Ahmed's Spoken, literary, spoken French into a literary French, and a French more easily understood by those who might be consuming a novel. This shows how translation is not only necessitated between languages, but that race and class, and identity in general, can necessitate translation just as much as a foreign language. Azusa's positionality in French society does make him almost as ideal of a translator as there could be for Ahmed's story. He too grew up in a shantytown as a second generation Buddha. The split in Ahmed and Azusa's stories, however, seems to occur in their formative years, whereas Ahmed had a more difficult time assimilating into the French education system and culture. Azusa excelled because, as he says in his autobiography, Le Grand de Chava, translated as Shantytown Kid, I'm ashamed of my ignorance. For some months now, I have decided to change my skin. I do not like being with the poor and the weak in the class. I want to be among the top students, like the French. And he does become among the top students. However, this causes him to lose standing in his indigenous community, and the, his fellow students tease him. You're not an Arab. Why aren't you last with us? He graded you second. You're with the French kids. Just because you're not an Arab, but a gallery like them. No, I am an Arab. I work well. That's why I have grades. Everyone can be one like me. That's it. You're French. Or maybe you look Arab like us, but you really love to be French. Despite his private desire to be like the French, Azus as a child denies it to his community. This double bind placed on someone forced to rise on the French's terms from the Shantytown way of life is a lose lose either way. After all, one can be sure that it was not his fellow Beur who taught Azus that he should be, quote, ashamed of his skin, end quote. Still, in a sense, for Azus, transiting Ahmed's story was a means of writing these perceived disavowals of his community. In this way, Ahmed de Bourbon shows how translation can also be a kind of self-redemption. Azuz had a pointed political purpose in his translation, which was to create a sympathetic portrayal of a migrant in the midst of anti-emigrant sentiment in France, much like that which can be seen today in the centers of power in the global north. 
and this can be attested to not only by the case of Calais in France, but by the Brexit vote in the UK and the rise of Trump in the States. The prologue of the book not only acts as an introduction to the novel, but the plea for the reader's attention and the promise from an authoritative voice, Azuz, who is prominent in French politics, that the reader will embark on an enjoyable read and a universal story, as Azuz calls it. Interceding on behalf of migrants to an unreceptive public is one such way in which the role of the translator of migrant literature can be conceptualized. However, this role is one that comes with a responsibility that goes beyond the discussion of the translator's responsibility or fidelity to a text. As by now it is well known, textual representations impact real people. In the case of the migrant, and particularly the forced migrant, these representations can often have life-changing impacts. Azusa's approach of trying to create a sympathetic portrait makes sense given the way the media in the global north often portrays migrants. We would argue, however, that creating an empathetic character, as often it becomes in this text, does not necessarily translate to concrete action. People feel proud of themselves for even being able to experience empathy for this migrant other. We feel that they can call it a day after that. Additionally, the role of a translator when translating migrant literature must be to lift migrant voices up and, in a way, submit themselves to the text and make themselves become secondary. Obviously, in a context in which the work of translation is already devalued and viewed as secondary to literary production, I can see how this might touch a nerve to say the least. But let's consider the position of the image of the literary or official translator, which I specify because many migrants translate out of necessity, yet their work is not seen as translation, vis-a-vis -vis the forced migrant. The literary translator is generally established in some way, and knows enough to be able to effectively communicate between cultures on a literary level. They are not necessarily rich or famous, but they are often well off enough to get by. How often is this the case for forced migrants, or even their succeeding generations? We know that success stories like Azusa's are exceptions, not rules, and indicate systemic inequality more than progress towards some form of migrant justice. When, as a translator, our work impacts very real bodies, the answer to some problematics that translation studies has exposed must change. The translator of migrant literature is not a mediator between two parties or cultures, but rather someone who must, who must stand on the side of the migrant in order to attempt to balance the scales between them and a society that would rather see them perpetually stuck behind borders than accept them as one of their own. Loredana Poletzi's article, Translation and Migration, also offers a useful lens through which to conceptualize the role of the translator when working with migrant literature. In her article, she discusses migrants as self-translators, stating that, from a translation studies point of view, it is crucial to note that when migrants act as their own self-translators, the boundary between an original and its translation becomes particularly fuzzy, requiring us to broaden the notion of translation. Many cases of self-translation, in fact, do not follow the familiar binary model in which a pre-existing source text moves across linguistic and cultural frontiers in a linear fashion. Non-linear forms of translation are common in migration contexts and include all of these cases, and perhaps these two are the norm rather than the exception, where the source and target text interact in more complex ways, because one does not simply perceive the other or does not even exist, or because the two cannot be neatly separated or often because the initial translation continues to generate further transpositions, back translations, and reprobations. This is exactly the case with the text of Ahmed de Rouen. As Poletzi writes, quote, migration reminds us that it is not only text that travel, but also people. As such, when working with migrant literature, it is important to remember the human aspect and the fidelity that may be owed to people as much as the fidelity that is debatably owed to the text or author. If we take into account people rather than, or at least as well as texts, then the implications of translating then necessarily foreground ethical questions, as Pilezzi also writes. There is, after all, a crucial difference between manipulating, domesticating, or even betraying a literary work and doing the same with a human being. This is very much apparent in Ahmed's text, as the human and non-fictional elements are underscored in it not only from the introduction by Azuz, but also by the orality present from Ahmed's original narration. It is difficult to separate the text from the human that underwent the odyssey that Ahmed endured. Due to the debated origins of this text, the role and agenda of the translator is not only important, but also divided between Azuz and Ahmed. As Pilezzi writes, quote, 
In public context, the migrant is often perceived as someone who necessitates translation, whether as a form of support or as a means of control or both. This is very much in line with Azusa's political purpose in creating an empathetic figure of the Berne in France. Ahmed's story did quite literally necessitate translation to those who did not grow up in Ahmed and Azusa's shanty towns. The effect of this on Ahmed's text, whether it negotiated and whether or not it negotiated the space where Ahmed's story and the story of others in similar circumstances could take up a recognized place in French society, remains to be seen. In addition to the technical and procedural challenges of translation, Ahmed de Bourbon poses other politicized, but not political, as all translation is already political, problems due to its content and form. Ahmed de Bourbon challenges contemporary ideas pertaining to linguistic nationalism and belonging, and also at times touches on religious, uh, sorry, religion, immigration, and racism. By presenting the story of a Francophone Arab who views France as his homeland, and not Algeria, where, as his deportation is a testament to, he is from in the eyes of French authorities, Ahmed de Bourgogne offers an alternative narrative to challenge the idea that a Frenchman is white of European origin and Christian. Conversely, throughout the text, Ahmed develops a very close-knit relationship with Christianity, something that flies in the face of the Arab equals Muslim paradigm that has been constructed in the global north. At times, Ahmed prays to Jésus-Christ Jesus Christ, and then asks Allah to forgive him, underscoring the, his own challenges and experiences trying to negotiate Arab and French identities, which are presented to him as being incompatible. This portrait also debunks many stereotypes about the Burma migrant in the French imaginary. This is incredibly subversive due to the fact that ideas of race, religion, and language are integral to the development of European nationalisms and what kind of person belongs where. When translated into English, the same challenge is made, particularly in the context of the global war. After being released from jail for the first time, Ahmed talks about what life became on a day-to-day -day basis. The constant fear of deportation ate away at my morale. I was angry with my father, who had kept his Algerian nationality for his children, in hope of returning to the Belid one day with his whole family. My life, however, had been built here. I was a Burgundian through and through. More than ever, I needed roots, a starting point and mine could be found on the side of the Mediterranean. I didn't know anything about Algeria, except for the gruesome violence that reigned there, and of which I didn't understand a thing. Deportation terrified me. I knew it was only a matter of time. <coughs> Ahmed's distortion of his identity as a Burgonian challenges not only French ethno-nationalist paradigms, but ethno-nationalist paradigms that exist in most countries as well. His story also offers a chance for a marginalized voice to speak out about lived experiences under the threat of deportation to a place where they have not built a life, an aspect that is often missing from official and public discourses on immigration. Additionally, the text takes on uh, issues such as racial profiling and once again allows for the marginalized side of the story to be told. At the police station, I finally learned that some guy had committed two assaults in the neighborhood that day. A witness had formally identified me as the assailant. Another had explained that I looked like the assailant, but that it wasn't me. The cops didn't even bother to ask any questions. My file was too heavy. The public prosecutor didn't even try to defend me. I was sentenced to eight months, but the department made an appeal, given that it was of the utmost importance to teach a good lesson to a dangerous repeat offender such as myself. Final verdict, 15 months. Finally, some of the most eye-opening scenes occur during Ahmed's odyssey back to France. The description of the conditions in which Ahmed was traveling were horrifying, and the descriptions of his treatment when caught by border patrols equally so. We were completely disoriented. I chose to go right on a whim. We were in the middle of no man's land, really, and it was true, we were in the middle of a twilight zone. Guided by intuition that we had to go right to push further into Bulgaria, I again went into the forest, and we went back to our forced march, crawling on our knees. We came across a guard fence that ran alongside a road, and I knew at the head of the group, and myself taking up the rear, in snow-covered silence. Suddenly, a voice crippled, on, crippled our muscles. Halt! Stop! Behind the blinding light of a torch, three shadows were brandishing AK-47s at us. Three shadows of a Bulgarian taste. We were definitely in Bulgaria. We were in a bad way, frozen, sick after walking through night, and we found ourselves trapped like rats at the mercy of these border patrols who were kicking us like dogs. 
All these issues presented in the text hit very poignantly in the current context of discourse on immigration in the centers of power in the global world. These excerpts provide the migrants a story, a human and humanizing point of view. In mainstream discourse on immigration, it is all too often the voices of migrants, refugees, and those perceived as migrants and refugees that are silenced. The voices of migrants are often the very first thing to get left out of their own stories, but once the reader is forced to confront them, it at least becomes harder to ignore. This is also one of the powers embedded in this text, and one aspect that migrant literature can add to discourses on immigration. After reading this text, it's hard to fathom why anyone would choose to undergo the things forced migrants and refugees do, unless they were completely out of other options. Throughout the entire translation process, I approached the translation as a productive and not reproductive act, and as an act of political resistance. Here, the approach was surrendering to the text, which Gaetari Spivak describes in the article The Politics of Translation, um, in order to, quote, earn permission to transgress from the trace of the other before memory, and the closest places of, of the self is relevant, end quote. Well, Spivak discusses surrender in the context of women translators and solidarity with women writers, I wrote a different kind of solidarity to this text, one based on contemporary inequities in race, education, and citizenship status. As a translator, I felt politically obligated to surrender to both authors of the text, and maybe even more so to Ahmed and Yazoud, in order to understand as best I could and then convey all the intricacies of the text, because, as Sivak also points out, it is imperative to not play it safe when it comes to the rendering of the text. Indeed, to play it safe with this text would be missing an opportunity to lift up a voice that is so often actively silenced or would even give them the opportunity to speak, manipulated and ignored by the general public. While the risk of extreme violence to the text, that such risk can entail is daunting, because of the strength of this text, the translator is under an obligation to take this risk. Overall, Ahmed de Bourbon poses an interesting and almost anxiogenic challenge to the translator. However, this is a symptom of our current context and not anything inherent to the text itself. Theories like surrendering to the text, liberating the text, and those of the migrant translator work in order to render the text in translation in a way that respects the ordeal through which Ahmed suffered while respecting the role of the translator as productive and allowing the text to have an afterlife in which it communicates ideas across time, space, and borders, much in the same way that Ahmed chose to tell the story in the first place. When translating this text, the translator is translating at once a person, a story, a literary text, and the stories of countless people who have also lived Ahmed's journey, who could have lived it, or who have yet to live it. It is a text that has the potential to live many different lives, and hopefully which, one day, will settle into an afterlife as a story that offers a window into a distant past where events like the ones taking place in Calais and across the globe are unthinkable. The translation of more and more stories of migrants and refugees in addition to recognizing the agency of the self-translation they undertake themselves can help contribute to such an initiative. Thank you. Thank you. So questions, comments, fields? Creating an empathetic character doesn't lead to complete action, and that's like um, as perceived by a foreign or like or like a national of France. But a national of like a national of France would not be empathetic; he would be sympathetic. Um, well, the point that that I was kind of trying to make is um, a lot of times people undertake initiatives. Um, translation is one of them, but also generally trying to portray um, immigrants saying oh, I'll just, I'll tell the real story and then people will feel bad and then we can fix this. Um, but a lot of times, um, people who, French nationals, American nationals, Canadian nationals, people who hold power in the society that the migrant is moving to, um, you know, maybe they'll read this text, they'll watch a movie, and then they'll say like, oh, that's sad, wow, I'm such a good person for feeling sad about this, like, I can go on with my day now. Um, so I'm just, I want to call attention to the fact that um, as, first of all, as people in those societies, our job is not done by simply saying, oh wow, that's so sad, but also um, we need to think about does this trope of kind of like the sympathetic um, migrant or refugee really work in translating into action and change? I 
I want to go back to your idea about you know, uh, translation as a translation of the self, right? And that the connection one could make between that and the title itself. Mm -hmm. uh, um, because in the, in the also use part of the novel where he says, Je suis pour Vigna, right? Um, and the fact that he's already translating himself for us, not as an immigrant anymore, mm -hmm. but as a Frenchman, actually, that is the claim that he makes. You know, I'm not Algerian, I'm not an immigrant, I am French. Je suis de Bougain. Um So I thought, you know, you could even begin the whole discussion around self uh, uh, translation the title that actually Azuz uh, creates out of his oral story. Because he refers to himself as Ahmed the Book of Nia. Yeah. 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 Uh, depiction in this type of battle he was going with himself and trying to uh, maintain his Algerian uh, identity as an Arab man, but also as a friend. I mean, seeing himself as authentically part of his French culture. I guess what's kind of, uh, I would say, that I'm trying to grapple with concerning the subject is the question of French nationalism, because during this time, uh, I mean, later on, uh, 1920s, you get a sense of cultural migration into France, where if you're looking at Black American jazz culture, and where French come and they they map their their uh, a lot of their music culture in this particular music. So then, with them doing that, how does that when they contradict this notion of French nationality that is excluding him? Because if it, that's what I'm trying to grapple with uh, concerning, you know, this this and of cultural migration, and then the French imposing this type of standard, you know, nationalism, but then they have imported this culture and, and they've immersed it into their own as part of French culture. But I get that, that's what I'm trying to read that grapple with. Um, I, I'm not familiar with, um, I guess, this particular instance, but just what I'm hearing, I mean, I think it would fall into this idea of kind of like cultural appropriation, right? Like, trying to take from someone something it's like oh we like this and we're in power in society so we're going to take this mm -hmm. and when that happens and you see in the states too yes. right like the people with <coughs> this cultural product like originated their connection to it is people try to erase it yeah. they try to pretend like oh this this has always been french this has always been whatever mm -hmm. um so i mean i think it's a function of power right like people in power are going to take what they want and try to twist the narrative in a way that fits them. Um, but like I said, I'm not super familiar with this part, with like this particular um, thing that you're talking about, although I'd be really interested in hearing more about this. Sure. I mean, prior to the, I mean, World War One and going to World War Two, seeing a lot of it, you know, Josephine Baker's, the Red Bread Tops, leading all the evening until now. But it's just, it's just, it's just um, that's what I'm trying to uh, grapple with. I guess what, what is French culture, or what is the French culture, then you use jazz and blues and, and incorporating this as being, you know, part of French culture, but then he's excluded. But you're saying he's not French, you know, that's, that's what I'm trying to grab. Well, yeah, I mean, he definitely, throughout the text, he definitely very much asserts the fact that, like, I am French, which also kind of breaks from other Baroque literary conventions where they do construct this kind of diaspora, immigrant identity, however you want call it, where it's like, I am, I'm not French and um, Arab, I'm not like Arab or French, I'm just kind of a new identity in the first place, but Ahmed takes a stance very much like I am just French. But also if I may add to this discussion, since you mentioned cultural appropriation, uh, I suppose is a, an example of cultural appropriation, because he is a success story. The author is actually the, the flip side of the coin. I mean, their 
both birth. One of them is a clandestine criminal, criminalized by French society, and the other mm -hmm. has, is also of Algerian origin, which has risen to become minister of migration in France. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, Azuz is claimed, not just claims to be French, but is claimed by France because it is a success story, mm -hmm. whereas Vinatif is disowned because, you know, he, he it represents failure, mm -hmm. failure to be uh, civilized, basically, mm -hmm. right? Uh, um, uh, that's why they, they, they put him in jail and, uh, you know, um, and then they deport him. And I guess also, if you're talking about jazz, how often do, um, like uh, hegemonic American and French nationalisms claim actual black people, right? They'll yeah. claim icons or cultural exactly. products, but not anyone who doesn't fit, who can't serve a purpose for them, essentially. Right. Yeah. So I, I kind of noticed when I went to when Paris and my sister was staying there, and we had discourse about this, that there was, you know, the fact that she could speak French. And you know she had a particular skin color. She didn't, you know, you know. Okay, you're not African. You're not from uh, Senegal or Cote d'Ivoire. Okay, you're you're uh, uh, um, American Noir. Okay. So what I've noticed with that is then because of this fascination with jazz music in Black American culture, I noticed this type of hierarchy that was created in France above the African. You know, where you're you're more like the the it's civilized black person, you know, that we can tolerate because we like your music and we like your culture and, and, and but there's a different uh, uh, hierarchy when it comes to an African, but then going to museums and seeing them have these sculptures of African women, you know, so it's, it's okay, now is this a form of, you know, this thing about the French that someone once told me, but it's like the French, they don't want them to be French, but then they don't want you to stop speaking French. Right. They don't want you to lose, you know, that connection with French. You know, when I think it was in the Congo, when was it the Congo or one of those uh, particular African nations where they were going to, there were talks about this man in French. And the French are like, no, you can't do that. You know, you, you have to speak French. But then it's like, you're not going to speak French. Right. I'm still grappling <laughs> with the French. But actually, they have to grapple with what we, they have to grapple with. Being French is all about. Because one of the things that are, are actually fascinating about this text is its language, as Nigel pointed out, and the fact that they, you know, Azus deliberately um, respects mm -hmm. to a great extent the Argo, you know, the slang that Ahmed actually uses mm -hmm. when he records his story. So that for any sort of uh, prim and proper French woman or man, this is really very sort of, it, it's, it's not just street French, but uh, bird French. So, you see. So they, they, they also have to come to terms with what French as a language is, has become, mm -hmm. and what French culture has become. Has become you know, and it's not something that they can control, I think. We have to have one more comment or question. Yes, Um, Going back to Dr. Samia's comment about self-translation, I think that puts Ahmed at the forefront because he's the creator of the text. Mm -hmm. Like this, the story happens to him, and he's also translating himself. Right. Like there are two forms of translation, mm -hmm. translating it from verbal into the literary, and translating his inner being into the verbal part. And there's also, you can also conceptualize this of not as uh, essential, which lots of, like, to you, which lots of uh, Western philosophers have, but in the sense that uh, Edward Said writes about in Orientalism, or Dr. Uh, Conti <coughs> writes about in Under Western Eyes, where the self is actually constructed as a discourse. And in that sense, um, it's also, it also puts him at the forefront because this is an instance where, um, as, where, um, a migrant is constructing a discourse about his self and centering himself in the discourse which so often. I think it's important to empower him 
because I think that the French nationals would be more inclined to empower the translator because he's the refined party in this whole process. He's the one who has been able to civilize the story into a form that they could read, that they could talk about. So I think that acknowledging Ahmed is like important. Yeah, one sort of final remark, they actually ended up taking each other to court mm -hmm. over this uh, collaborative work. Mm -hmm. And it was a competition over who is the hero, who mm -hmm. is the author, uh, <coughs> who has transcribed basically <coughs> the oral story that was recorded by Ahmed bin or is it Ahmed bin who is actually the um, the story itself. Um, um, who won? I can't you know, I didn't keep up with the, you know, who won, but it was really fascinating to see uh, that this collaborative uh, project turned it sour because of, you know, this contest over who is the translator mm -hmm. of the story. Right? Is it relative because it says and he recorded it? as a form of translation of the experience itself. Or is it Azuz because he's the one who transcribed it from the... Um, and uh, actually, uh, Maggie as well has her own intervention when you look, for example, at the um, punctuation of the text in French. Yeah. One of the things that Azuz tried to do is safeguard the run-on sentences. Mm -hmm. Because in the oral recording, mm -hmm. he just speaks, and so they are really, you can't tell when there's a full stop. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you translate it, man, it, you have lots of full stops, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You tell us why. And when you read it, you know, um, you, you, you were aware of these full stops, and you actually did stop, and it gives a I would argue a different reading to the text from the French that deliberately leaves out uh, for stops in particular. There are lots of comments, but yeah. So tell me about that decision. Um, well, I think that the um, grammar use in the French is necessary to preserve you around me in French. The, when you translate it into English, it doesn't. Even as morality, it just doesn't work. Like an English speaker, just when, when they're just talking, when they speak like that. Um, so I am trying to preserve the morality. Just um, the cadences are different in between the languages, and just necessitate different. Well, thank you very much. Really